Welcome to the Neuroscience Meets SEL podcast, episode number 29. My name is Andrea Samadhi, a former educator who's been fascinated with understanding the science behind high performance strategies in schools, sports, and the workplace for the past 20 years. Let's dive right into this topic on how to rewire your brain for happiness and well being to optimize learning. I'm sure most of us are aware that stress is the number one cause behind anxiety, depression, low energy, work burnout, and cardiovascular disease. But do you know how stress impacts our brain? Did you know that chronic stress and depression causes measurable brain shrinkage? Or that 51% of us will have a mental health issue, something like post-traumatic stress, obsessive compulsive, personality, anxiety, addiction, or an eating disorder, to name a few, at some point in our life, and that one out of five students struggle with depression, while one out of four struggle with anxiety, which means we've reached epidemic levels with today's youth. And these shocking statistics impact society with work burnout, neurological disorders, health problems that eventually lead to death. And stress is also impacting our students, whether they're at home or in the classroom. A recent study shows that if the educator or parent is stressed, the student will also be stressed. Stress is impacting our ability to learn, and student behavior is being impacted, contributing to more stress for educators. So it's a bad cycle. Dr. Daniel Amen, a psychiatrist and brain disorder specialist of the Amen Clinics, and the father of Chloe Amen, she was from Podcast 25. She did the strategies to change your brain, to change your grades. He explains that if you struggle with attention, focus, sadness, anxiety, worry, flexibility, stubbornness, or impulsivity, welcome to the club. This is normal. These days, it's more normal to have a problem than not have a problem. Most of us will have a mental health issue in our lifetime, and when it happens, we think that we're the only one and that no one else understands. Dr. Amen has a book coming out March 3rd of 2020, and it's called The End of Mental Illness, How Neuroscience is Transforming Psychiatry and Helping Prevent or Reverse Mood and Anxiety Disorders, things like ADHD, addictions, PTSD, psychosis, personality disorders, and more. He says if left untreated, these brain disorders can have serious personal, interpersonal, occupational, and social consequences. Within the book, you'll find at least a hundred simple things you can do yourself to heal your brain and prevent or reverse problems. I follow his Brain Warrior Way podcast, and you can definitely pre-order your copy of The End of Mental Illness on Amazon. But also an interesting activity to try is to identify and optimize your brain type. Um, You can take, I'll put a link in the show notes, you can take his assessment. It's an excellent resource. You get an idea of what brain type you have and you answer some questions and receive an email with a video explaining your brain type and the characteristics of your brain type, dietary suggestions, and a brain fit score. And I got a brain fit score of 82 out of 100 with brain type 1, and I'm fully aware of the areas that I can improve on. It was accurate. What came through on my report is consistent to the areas I'm currently working on. And the dietary suggestions were also right on the mark for me. So awareness is the key so that we can take action and make improvements. So definitely try out that assessment. It's fun. In this episode, we're going to look at the neuroscience of happiness, anxiety, stress, and learning with some ideas and strategies to naturally improve each area so that we can get a handle on life's largest challenges with an understanding of our brain chemistry. Our goal is to intentionally set ourselves up for success with this new level of awareness. Have you ever thought about your brain with regards to your work or learning, success or productivity? What about your happiness, personal life, or relationships? Your brain controls everything that you do, so when it works right, you work right. It's only been the past five years for me where I've been learning about the importance of my brain and its health, and I'm not surprised that the recent advances in neuroscience have led to an emerging field of educational neuroscience, bringing together researchers in cognitive neuroscience, educational psychology, and technology to create new programs for the classroom, as well as in healthcare and other areas. So why not look at this application of these ideas for the workplace and our personal lives as well? 
Mental health is something that society just doesn't talk openly about. When I look at my personal family situation with my two parents and two sisters and myself, my parents and both of my sisters struggled with depression at some point. And you can add me to the statistics because I just didn't figure out healthy eating habits until my late 20s. Although my family didn't talk about the importance of mental health growing up or the importance of diet, I remember begging my dad to let me go running one day in an ice storm because exercise has always been my go-to strategy for mental well-being. I just didn't have any other strategies at the time. And so no one was surprised when I decided to move from Toronto where half the year is dark, gloomy, freezing weather to the sunny, bright, warm climate in Arizona where there's year-round sunshine and lots of mountains to go hiking every day. Um, but if you don't have the ability to pick up and move somewhere else, knowing how important the environment you live in and how it affects your happiness, there's so many other strategies and resources to boost your serotonin and happiness that you can do. Just growing up as a kid, I always thought, you know, if I could help my parents a little bit more with reducing their stress, maybe if I cleaned the house a bit more, they'd be happier. But uh, understanding the chemistry of, of our brains is important and everyone's brain is different. So we've got to look at strategies to help and promote our own brain and body health for optimal results in our life. So remember podcast number 27 with Frederica Fabritas. Uh, we covered the DNA of success or peak performance, which is that brain state where we lose the presence of time and we're the most productive. So that's the neuroscience of success. She mentions the importance of having fun with your work that releases the neurotransmitter dopamine and having just enough fear or a challenge to release the neurotransmitter noradrenaline and that with these two factors, focus will occur and then the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released. And these three factors must be in place for peak performance to occur and when we hit this level of performance, it's important that we're able to manage our distractions so that we can stay here for longer periods of time and productivity. Throughout the episodes on this podcast, I've been focused on finding those leaders who are doing important work in the field of social emotional learning and neuroscience or education just to show how these two emerging fields can impact our cognitive abilities. It's clear that people are drawn to this work, not just in schools, but this understanding has implications in so many different areas of society, like economics, law, security, even politics. And just this morning, I was listening to Lewis Howe's podcast, The School of Greatness, and he was talking about just this very topic with a different angle. So thank you for everyone that's tuning in. We've so far hit over 38 countries and I appreciate all the feedback I get. If you have ideas or suggestions of podcast guests that uh, would match this content, please do send me a message on Twitter or LinkedIn. You can find me on social media. So what is the neuroscience of happiness? We all want to experience happiness and there is a neuroscience to happiness. Dr. Rick Hansen, he's a neuropsychologist and New York Times bestselling author, one of the leading experts in the neuroscience of happiness. He opened his Mindful Peace Summit talk that he did this past year by talking about how he got into this work with mindfulness because he began searching for answers to the neuroscience of happiness when in his youth he was wondering why people were so unhappy, including himself. He wanted to be less lonely and more proud of himself. And he recalled most of his childhood feeling less than others, so he grew up lacking confidence in himself. If we don't get the acceptance we needed growing up, this will translate into an emptiness that just lingers with our mindset and it will impact our future performance. Dr. Hansen explains that if you wanna be more confident, you must embrace experiences that bring out your confidence. We see many young people who were bullied as a kid turn to wrestling or boxing or something like that as a way to fight and get their confidence back. Dr. Hansen noticed in college that when he ignored how he was feeling, he just kept feeling bad about himself. And when he has a positive experience and he stayed with it, over time, he was able to build more positive experiences than negative, building up his confidence. That's this diagram here. So the green is the positive experiences and the red are the negative. Eventually, the negatives fade out. And this is called the negativity bias, something that we've got to be aware of because we've got to at least have a ratio of five to one positives 
So five positives to one negative, because as parents, teachers, coaches, coworkers, we've got to remember when we're giving feedback or when we've had certain experiences, that one negative will stick unless we have five positives. Because he explains that good experiences bounce off the brain like Teflon and bad experiences stick to the brain like Velcro. So if you just think about it, if you've ever had feedback, you know, you've been told a whole bunch of great things about yourself, your performance, something you've been doing, and you get one piece of criticism is that one piece of criticism that you'll remember two or three years down the line. It's just the way the brain works. So be sure to consciously focus on positive experiences so you won't let that one negative stick around and impact your mindset and your future results. Remember the brain has mood chemicals called neurotransmitters that are chemical messengers sent into the synapse of a neuron by an electrical charge in the axon released in the synaptic gap to communicate with dendrites of another neuron. So this is impacted by exercise and nutrition. So levels of the different neurotransmitters have profound effects on emotion, perception, memory, alertness, and energy. If you're someone who enjoys intense exercise, you'll notice the benefits of endorphins that are released in the brain and reduce our perception of pain. Researchers are still not sure what causes us to have chemical imbalances in the brain when we don't feel right. There's just some things that we can do to change the chemistry of our brain. These suggestions have been compiled as I'm researching these areas to offer ideas, strategies, and suggestions just to bring more awareness of these topics. So what are some strategies to increase happiness and naturally increase your serotonin levels? First, embrace experiences that bring out your confidence. Do you know what makes you happy? This takes self-awareness. Do you know what makes other people happy? Do you ask them? Learn more about others by saying, hey, how's it going? And listen to what they actually say. Taking this extra step will strengthen your relationship with your coworkers, your friends, or your relationship. Remember that five to one negativity bias and say at least five positives to every one negative piece of feedback, remembering that those good experiences will bounce off the brain like Teflon and bad experiences will stick to the brain like Velcro. Remember that neurons that fire together wire together, so those good experiences will wire together and stick around, keeping positive feelings in the brain, and eventually those negative ones will fade away since neurons that are out of sync fail to link. Think of new ways to generate happiness and start practices that make you feel happier and better about yourself. It's our responsibility to generate our own happiness. No one can do this for you. And finally, diet, exercise, and supplements. If you're on track with these, you're pretty much on track with your well-being and happiness. But these naturally boost serotonin levels, increasing happiness. Um, there's supplements like saffron, 5-HTP, or even eating low glycemic healthy carbs like hummus or berries just to keep your um, blood sugar levels even, and be sure you take your probiotics to keep a healthy gut. So what about the neuroscience of anxiety? We've got to calm the basal ganglia, the emotional part of our brain. So within our limbic system, our emotional brain is the basal ganglia. That's when it's revved high, it makes us feel anxious. Do you know the difference between anxiety, which is our body's natural response to stress that can become a mental disorder when someone regularly feels unusually high levels of anxiety, or stress, which is our body's response to a challenge or demand? Some anxiety is normal, and the same goes for stress. We know there are three levels of stress response, the first being positive, where we've got a brief increase in heart rate, mild elevations, and stress hormone levels. This is what happens when we need to speak in front of a crowd or play a sport or take a test. It's that nervous energy that we feel before a job interview. And this stress is okay. It's necessary. It's part of our life. Then there's tolerable stress that we can handle. It's serious but temporary stress response that could be buffered by supportive relationships. The key is to have a support system in place to handle tolerable stress in our lives. But the third one that's the one that we're most concerned about or worried about is toxic stress. And that's when we have prolonged activation of stress response systems without relationships to help buffer these stress responses. We must have strategies in place to help us reduce anxiety and stress so they don't interfere with our day-to-day -day life. 
So when most of us are stressed in our lives, it could lead to unhealthy behaviors if we don't have a recipe for healthy behaviors. Just a quick brain fact, did you know that of the thousands of thoughts a person has every day, it's estimated that 70% of our mental chatter is negative, self-critical, pessimistic, and fearful. So if we don't have a strategy in place to change what is automatic negative thinking, then we'll naturally go down this path. So here are some strategies to reduce anxiety and stress. The first would be exercise, meditation, and deep belly breathing to increase oxygen to the brain. So we know this, these are the most common strategies. Another one is to go for a walk outside. Research shows that different brain regions are activated when you're outside. So if you can get out into the sunshine, it increases the production of vitamin D and serotonin, plus it just feels good. If you can't go outside, just look for a window. Another strategy is to zone out. Let yourself do nothing for a while and just let your mind wander. Research shows that the creative incubation happens during mind wandering you're more likely to problem solve successfully if you let your mind wander and then come back to a challenge. Dr. Srini Pillay writes about the power of the unfocused mind in his most recent book, Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try, where you sharpen your ability to problem solve or get things done when you let your mind wander. So flashes of insight, he says, and solutions to problems often show up at this time but you've just got to give yourself time for those breaks. We're often so busy that we don't allow for this. A fourth strategy is to unplug from technology. Silence is good for the brain. Another strategy, mental imagery. So thinking of warming in images like a cup of hot chocolate, if you're feeling stressed or a place that makes you happy like the beach. And then dietary supplements like fish oil, magnesium, L-theanine, that's that supplement that's available in green tea, and GABA supplements are known to help calm the brain. What about the neuroscience of learning? We know that there's a lot of chemicals involved in the brain during learning. There's acetylcholine, there's dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline. But as far as learning, think about this. Why is it that I can forget some words that I used to know in French but haven't practiced in a few years but I'll never forget my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Walker, teaching me how to play basketball or doing math equations. Why is it easier for me to learn a second language at age five versus age 55? And why do I learn better after a good night's sleep? And why is my creativity enhanced when I run up and down a mountain before I can sit at my desk and do my work? If there is a formula for peak performance, like we found out with Frederica Fabricius, the fun fear focus formula, there's got to be a neuroscience to happiness and anxiety, and there's also one for learning. Bruce McCandless, a professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Education and the director of the Stanford Center of the Mind, Brain, and Computation, believes that brain imaging technology is revolutionizing the study of educational experiences and their effect on the brain. These brain images are showing new insights on how children are learning how to read. He talks about the fact that when you focus your mind, you actually amplify the circuits in your brain that lead to learning and amplify information processing. This is something we spoke about back with Dr. Daniel Siegel, episode 28, when we were talking about his Wheel of Awareness meditation. And we were talking about how when we are intentionally focused on something, like his wheel of meditation asks you to focus on different parts of your body, whether it's our health, our relationships, our business, or our learning, we actually amplify what we're focusing on, that information processing, and we change the structure of the brain in this area. We're actually rewiring the brain with the activity we're doing. Remember that neurons that fire together wire together and neurons that are out of sync fail to link. So this is what's happening. When we're thinking or focused, those neurons are wiring, firing. Dr. Siegel mentioned that the research was there to show that this practice actually improves health in addition to many other benefits. So let's see if we could take this understanding to the next level of how neuroscience impacts the learning process so we can create more impactful lessons as an educator or thoughtful skill building drills as a coach or connect our employees to new ideas and information in an engaging and enjoyable manner. 
So what is the neuroscience of learning? We really can learn anything with the right study habits, with a positive growth mindset. That's when magic happens and where we can get to those aha moments of learning where that thing that we're learning that we just can't seem to get, it kind of just hits us at one moment and we say, aha, I've got it. So here's some strategies to increase our learning and reach those aha moments. So some strategies to increase learning, use emotion and frequency of use. So to help memory stick and motivation cues, context and frequency of use can all affect how accurately we remember something. So it's the reason why I remember my sixth grade teacher and frequency of use is the reason why I've forgotten most of the French words I used to know because I'm not practicing them. When learning a new skill, think about how you'll make it memorable. Find your focus. If you're a teacher, you can creatively get your students to somehow focus on their work. You'll be rewiring their brain, which will lead to learning. So whether it's putting their finger under each word they read or using a pointer on their finger as they read, however you can get a student to focus on what they're learning, this is where the magic happens. If you look at some of the most successful modern workplaces, you'll find that they have meditation and exercise rooms, dream walls to record visions and goals, and plenty of relaxation areas. So it's, of course, a place to grab a cup of tea, water, and coffee, and think about creative ways to stay on track and focused on the outcome of what you're working on. Be sure to add more happiness, joy, and laughter. The brain thrives with happiness, joy, and laughter. And the more we can create fun with our learning, we've seen with the peak performance and flow states, we'll be encouraging learning in a way that time will be lost. So remember the recipe for peak performance. And if we can intentionally practice strategies that reduce our stress and anxiety while increasing our happiness, we'll be well on our way to retaining what we're learning. So we can't ignore our brain or our mental health, but we could spend a few hours going really deep into this topic because the brain is so complex. The brain is involved in everything you do and everything you are, the way you think, feel, act, interact, your intelligence, character, decisions all come from your brain. So we've got to understand how our brain works. It's crucial for our future success. The brain really is a bridge to our goals. So just remember some important brain facts. The brain is involved in everything that you do. It's so complex. It just takes time to understand and study it. Remember your brain is fragile. It's soft like butter or tofu. So you've got to remember to protect it. When your brain works right, you work right. And we can rewire our brain to change our life with focus and effort. And just to sum everything up, we can increase our happiness, reduce stress, and prime our brain for learning. Some tips to increase your happiness, just try some new things that challenge you to build your confidence. Remember that five to one negativity bias, always give five bits of positive feedback to one negative. Remember to generate your own happiness. It's our responsibility. And it's not that difficult with diet, exercise and supplements, we're well on our way to being happy and healthy. And then for reducing anxiety and stress, exercise, meditation, deep breathing, go look up Dan Siegel's Wheel of Awareness. It has been proven to increase health. Go outside if you can. Remember vitamin D increases with sunshine and if you can't go outside, just get to a window. Zone out, remember that creative incubation that happens when you give your mind a break and just think of nothing. Mental imagery, if you're stressed, think of something or a place that makes you happy. And again, your, your diet, exercise and supplements. On our next episode with Mark Waldman, we're going to uncover the new brain research documented in Mark's new book, Neuro Wisdom, showing that relaxation, creativity, imagination and intuition are essential for learning and problem solving. See you next week.